Well, before we do uh, Galatians 3, we, we're going to do all of uh, Romans and Acts. No. Yeah, I'm game. <laughs> no, what I wanted to do is give you a four-point summary of everything we've talked about thus far. Okay, so if you've got your notes and you want to write these down, they may be handy, okay? So we're in the book of Galatians. We've covered the first two chapters. Here are the points. The contrast in Galatians is between gospel and not gospel. There's a real battle happening among the Galatian churches and within the Galatian membership for gospel and not gospel. The motivation for all this is people trying to decide whether they're going to be pleasing God or pleasing man. I think you can guess that if you're one of the gospel people, you're probably more concerned with God than anybody else. If you're one of the not gospel people, chances are you're more concerned with everybody else and God can follow along if he can keep up. Pleasing God is by grace through faith always. That's the only possible way to please God is by grace through faith. Pleasing man is legalistic always. Why is that? Because if I realize that you're pleasing me, I'm going to have a wonderful time creating hoops for you to jump through. You know? Any of you in sales? Yeah, wise people. <laughs> what happens in sales when, when you meet your quota? They say, thank you for about 20 seconds, and then they raise your quota, right? And people can be successful in marketing and sales for 20 years, and in year 21, they miss their quota. And the company lovingly says, hey, sorry, you missed it. Out of here. That's legalism. Grace through faith is for God. Legalism is for humans, okay? So that's, that's a review of the first two chapters. And now we're going to go into chapter three. But first, I've got to get a prop. You may think this is a microphone stand. It is not. This looks like film. Remember film? It's not. And I got to do this and <laughs> try not to mess myself up. Anybody recognize this? It's fly paper. Yeah. Yeah, this is lovely stuff. And I've got to try and get it connected up here. And I've got it all over me. Let go, let go. Shall we stand for the benediction? <laughs> what is that all about? We'll get to that. But I want it to be hanging there so you can keep your eyes on it. Okay? I'll probably leave it there and use it again next week. And by then, it may be coated in things. And then potluck, right? That's what I'll be providing. All people will be blessed. How in the world are all people blessed through flypaper? Well, obviously, they're not. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn to Galatians 3. We'll be doing the first 14 verses, if I can get moving here. First, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Interesting that this phrase, this question, who has bewitched you, literally means 
who has given you the evil eye? Evil eye was a big thing back in those days because everybody's so superstitious. All you had to do was raise an eyebrow at someone. And then you'd give them the evil eye. And Paul uses that analogy to say, look, Jesus, the gospel we taught included what? The death of Jesus, the crucifixion. Did, did you receive the Spirit by works of law or by believing what you heard? Okay. Notice I didn't say works of the law. In, most, in almost every verse in Galatians 3 where law is occurring, the word the is not there. It's just works of law. Okay. And the believing what you heard, if you literally translate it, would be the hearing of faith. So you see the contrast? Works of law, hearing of faith. So did you get the Spirit by works of law or by hearing of faith? Which one? Hearing of faith. That's how you got the Spirit. And yet, you've been bewitched somehow. And you know what had happened? The Galatians had willingly flown in to the flypaper. What happens when a bug gets stuck on flypaper? They struggle, don't they? Ever watched them? You were all kids once. Oh, what's going on, Mom? You know. They struggle and they struggle and they flap, and the more they struggle, the more what? They get stuck. The more of this thing is coated on them. And they eventually starve to death. What Paul is saying in this particular part of the Bible, in his letter to the Galatians, is if, if you have been bewitched, if the evil eye has gotten to you and driven you to works of law, you are stuck on the flypaper. And the harder you work, the more stuck you're going to be, and it will kill you. It may not cost you your salvation. You've already been saved. These are saints. But to be that confused and stuck in the law, as opposed to the hearing of faith where you're free in Jesus Christ, it's a terrible, terrible difference. And he's going to explain it a hundred different ways, but always the same. Okay? So what he's asking the Galatians is who conned you into walking into the flypaper as opposed to sticking with the revealed word of God? What's the difference between flypaper and the Bible? They're both made out of paper. They're both strong. I mean, I've had this Bible for 30, 40 years and the pages are still not torn. It's wonderfully strong paper. That's strong because there's some big bugs that get caught on there. Well, the difference is that will kill you. This will give you life. Never forget that, okay? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Clearly, they knew the answer was that we got the Spirit by the hearing of faith. So we began our salvation experience in the Spirit, by faith. And now, somehow, because somebody's convinced us that flypaper is a good thing, we are trying to finish by means of the flesh. Have you experienced so much in vain? If really it was in vain? Some of your Bibles don't have the word experience there. Some of your Bibles will read suffered. The word can mean suffered, but in, in a positive statement, it means to experience something. And so the, the NIV, this is the latest version of the NIV, has got it right. 
everything they got from the Spirit, everything they experienced in the Spirit by faith is in danger of being all of that done in vain if they continue to try to finish the course in the flesh. So, hearing of faith works of law. Beginning in spirit, ending in flesh. Those are equated. So he said now two ways. You don't want to get stuck in law or flesh. Works of flesh. Paul is repeating himself. He's doing it on purpose. Remember, Paul is the Pharisee of Pharisees, the Jew of Jews. He's using Jewish-style argument here against Jewish-style problems. As we've studied before, people who have snuck in, come in under cover of something, have wormed their way into the hearts and minds of the Galatian people and have been coating them with flypaper for some amount of time. Paul has told them that they deserve to be eternally condemned. Later on, he's going to tell them that they should go ahead and finish the job. Here, he's just warning people that all of this wonderful start in the Spirit could be in vain if you don't come to your senses. So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by works of law or by your hearing of faith. Interesting, another interesting contrast. Um, if, if this were a, a class instead of a Sunday sermon, we'd probably spend three weeks on this passage. I looked up just a few of the key words in here. I've got 30 pages of notes on this passage alone. It's so rich. The, the, the use of the words, the play on words, is incredible. He's got work miracles and works of law. And we would look at that and say, well, it's kind of the same thing. No, it's not. The two words are different. The, the works of the law are, remember we talked about in, in Thessalonians, the works of faith, work, the, th the stuff you do with your hands, as opposed to the labor of love, which is how you expend yourself. It's an internal thing. This is you know, you're doing with your hands. You're trying to finish your salvation with your hands. <coughs> As opposed to work miracles, this is the Holy Spirit's work in, in its entirety. It's, it's an enabling, and then the word for miracles is the word from where we get dynamite. It's a form of that dunamis word. And, and it has to do with, with work realized completed and it's a miracle I mean, things have been happening there as a result of the working of the Holy Spirit and it, when the Holy Spirit is working the Holy Spirit enables us and completes in us what he starts All right Philippians 1 I'm confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion that's what he's saying here you have a choice, flypaper or allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work. You know the coolest thing about the Holy Spirit is that flypaper has no impact on the Holy Spirit? When you've come to Jesus by faith and received eternal life, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. When you wander, and all of us do, inevitably, all of us do at some point, wander over and get ourselves involved in the flypaper. You know, the Holy Spirit goes with us. And we, we sit there struggling and getting coated in this stuff, and pretty soon we're just all bound up in it. And the Holy Spirit is saying, Richard, let me fix this. Let me work a miracle. Let me complete my power in you. And if I say yes, this stuff just falls away like it was never there. 
but I have to take my eyes off of myself in order to realize it. Remember, see the contrast at the beginning? If I'm trying to please God, I'm not really trying to please God, I'm just responding to God. That's what pleases Him. It's by grace through faith. But if I'm trying to please men, it is always legalistic. The rules are always changing. The bar is always raised. I can never do enough. And Paul is painting this picture on purpose so that the Galatians will see this contrast. And he's saying to them, let the Spirit continue to do in you what he started in you. Continue the hearing of faith. Don't get stuck in the works of the flesh, the works of the law. I mean, this is radical stuff. For, for a Jew to imagine that flesh, always seen in Greek as a bad thing, sarks, the flesh. We have sin dwelling in our flesh. To equate the flesh with the law is unthinkable. Because for a good Jew, I use the law to subdue the flesh. And Paul is saying, no, you don't. If you use the law to subdue the flesh, what you have done is wrap yourself in flypaper and wonder why you're starving to death. Okay? So also, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Believed, again, it's that whole hearing with faith thing. Credited, it was applied to him, even though he didn't do it. And righteousness, a terribly rich word. Probably the easiest way to describe it is that to be righteous, or to have righteousness, is to be completely compliant with the will of a superior. To meet that superior's expectations. So if God credits someone with righteousness, then God has told that person, you measure up. You are in correct relationship with me. You can never get there by the works of the law, the works of your hands, the works of the flesh. You just can't do it. It is only achieved in relationship with Jesus Christ. So never let somebody tell you, righteousness just means right doing. And if you're going to right do things, then you'd better be doing the law. That's exactly what the Judaizers were doing to the Galatian believers. They were hammering them and hammering and hammering them. And as we'll see in a little bit, it was actually a racist approach that they were taking. We'll get to that. So where did, where did Paul get this quotation? It was credited to Abraham as righteousness. We got it in Genesis, chapter 15. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Fascinating place where this, this little vignette is taken from. In the previous chapter, Abraham has defeated the five kings who stole Lot and all you know, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, has come back, met, met Melchizedek and all of that. In this chapter, it begins with God setting up, and we've talked about this before, setting up the covenant with Abraham whereby he promised them the land of Israel forever and ever. And God sets up this covenant as a covenant with himself. Abraham had no part in it. He was just the recipient, the beneficiary. And so when, when God told him this, Abraham believed the Lord and credited it to him as righteousness. Okay? And then the very next chapter is what? Hagar and Ishmael. Abraham, one of Abraham's many forays into the flypaper. Right? We talk about Abraham being this great man of faith. And he was smacking face first into the wall all the time. And yet, he believed God. He heard with faith. Even if he couldn't always do it in his flesh every time, just like us, he still heard with faith. And God said, you're mine. You're my man. You're my woman. 
I declare you to be righteous. So understand then, really get this, right? Paul is waving a flag, right here, right here. Those who have faith are children of Abraham. Put yourself in the shoes of the Judaizers. Those who have faith are children of Abraham. Huh? I'm, chill, I'm a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have the law. And Moses is my guy. And the rest of you are dogs. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. That word nations is really the word ethnos, from where we get the word ethnic. It's more about people groups and tribes than it is about nations with governments. Let that sink in. All people, doesn't matter what color, what background, what part of the world, rich, poor, fat, thin, short, tall, in the middle, it doesn't matter. All people will be blessed through Abraham. To say that to a Jew was to tell a Jew that being a Jew meant nothing, at least with a Jew who believed what the Judaizers believed. You see why this was a racist issue? Judaizers were coming in and saying, you must be me in order to be a child of God. You must be me. Being Greek or Turkish or Ethiopian or anything else is not good enough. You must be me. And isn't that the way with all racist issues? Somebody is different, looks different, comes from a different background, acts different, speaks different, everything's different. And I'm afraid. I'm not willing to put up with different. And so I say, unless you're willing to be me, you can't play. Well, that's kind of hard when you're a different color or you speak a different language. What are we going to do? Jesus is the only answer out of this. And Paul is saying that to the Judaizers. Stop judging the Gentiles because they're not you. Because God has already told us that those who have faith are children of Abraham. It's not a birth issue. It's a belief issue. It's actually a new birth issue. There's the, the point. So where did we get this? I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. God told Abraham that three times. You think he meant it? He told Isaac once and Jacob once. So those three guys got this promise five times. God was being as emphatic as he can be. All peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. You don't have to be Jewish to be blessed. You don't have to be American to be blessed. You don't have to be a Republican to be blessed. <laughs> Not sure about the Democrats. No, you don't have to be a Democrat to be blessed. What do you have to be? A believer in Jesus Christ. So, those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You let that sink in, and it's, it's just the most radical stuff you can imagine. In fact, the word rely doesn't occur there. <laughs> but we don't know how to do it in English. It really says, so those who are of faith. Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the men of faith. They're not relying on faith. 
Relying on faith is like relying on works. That makes faith a work. Don't rely on faith. Rely on Jesus. And that means you are a person of faith. And notice that that faith isn't passive. It's when you try to rely on faith and say, well, what am I doing enough? You know, am I walking by faith? And then you turn it into legalism. But if you keep your eyes focused on Jesus and the Holy Spirit changes you from the inside out and completes what he started every day of your life, then those miracles that he was talking about earlier begin to occur. Love changes me. Really does change me. And Paul is arguing as passionately as he can, don't go to the law. Any law. I don't care if it's the Ten Commandments or your Aunt Sally. Don't go to law. Always respond by faith. For all who rely on works of law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Well, where did that come from? Deuteronomy. Um, if you have some, a chance after, after church, read Deuteronomy 27. It's, it's the first part of, of the curses and blessings chapters. And so there was a whole, half of the, the Israelites were put over on Mount Ebal and half over on Mount Gerizim. And the, the people on, on Mount Ebal were supposed to shout various things. If you do this, you will surely die. And the people on Mount Gerizim were supposed to say, Amen. And then the people on Gerizim were supposed to say things, if you do this, you will surely live. And the people on Mount Ebal were supposed to say, amen. And they rehearsed the law back and forth. Well, this is the last one of the curses. Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. And then all the people shall say, amen. That's God telling them <laughs> what to say and how to respond. I've given you this whole law. Yes, you have, Lord. We know you're your, we are your people. And then he says, oh, by the way, if you don't do everything, if you don't uphold this law by carrying out every aspect of it, uh, you're going to be cursed. And they were dumb enough to go, well, yeah, Amen. Well, are we any different? No, absolutely not. I mean, Bob talked about peer pressure last week. How many of us have made complete, utter fools of ourselves because we gave in to peer pressure, knowing full well that the result of whatever it was they're trying to convince you to do is, you know, is going to be bad. It's just not going to work. I mean, everybody tells stories like, you know, well, Johnny jumped off the roof. Well, you know, mom's, Johnny's mother lets him do it. Well, I'm not Johnny's mother. Now, don't jump off the roof unless there's, you know, something to land on there other than, you know, spikes of, of metal in the garden. What peer pressure. You know? One of my favorite cartoons. Um, it's a far side cartoon. And it shows a bunch of laboratory people in the white coats, scientists, and all of them have one eye right in the center of their head. And there's a guy standing there who's got a normal head. <laughs> and the other people are going, well, come on, come on, come on. Laboratory peer pressure. Drink what's in the beaker, end up with one eye in the middle of your head. Okay. We fall for this all the time. And God was just warning the people. If you don't keep everything, you're going to be cursed. So clearly, no one who relies on law is justified before God. What is justified? To be declared righteous, to be declared in a right standing with God, because the righteous will live by faith, not by law. Well, I thought Moses was the guy. And Paul is saying, no, Moses is not the guy. Moses had a role to play. Remember when we looked at the covenants, the Mosaic covenant? I described it as a covenant of preparation. God needed to create a people for himself. 
different than all of the people around them. The Mosaic Covenant was ideal for that. Custom built to create the nation of Israel. Even when they didn't keep it, it still formed them into the nation of Israel and God made sure that those people were protected and wandered through their history until Jesus was born. That's exactly what the covenant was for and it succeeded beautifully. See, it did exactly what God intended it to do because God made sure it would do that. That law isn't for us, except in the sense of preparing us for Jesus. If we're ready for Jesus, the law is done. We'll see that later, not today, later, next week or the week after. So clearly no one who relies on law is justified because the righteous live by faith. Well, where did, the, where did this quote come from? From Habakkuk 2.4. The, the, the story of Habakkuk, um, or the little book of Habakkuk, is a series of conversations between Habakkuk and God. And most of the conversations start out with Habakkuk saying, Okay, Lord, what gives? What is up with, with what's going on here? I mean, these, these people all around are picking on us. The people won't worship you. The outsiders keep coming in and messing things up. What's going on? I thought we were your people. I mean, it's almost like that. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And God responds. And so Habakkuk had just finished one of these, these diatribes and God responded saying, see, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. And he's telling him, don't worry about the enemy. The enemy is all arrogant and proud and is going to trip over his own feet. Don't look at the enemy. Look at me. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. You can't outsmart the enemy. Because the enemy is Satan. Satan is stronger than you and me. But if you are a child of the living God, you don't have to fight that battle. You run screaming into the throne room of, of God like a little girl saying, Abba, Father, help. You jump on his lap, and Jesus stands up, and Satan goes, Oh, never mind. Never mind. I'm out of here. Right? Satan can't touch you if you will walk by faith. He'll try to influence you, but he can't touch you. Now, the, the problem is that other people can touch you, and they may kill you. But what's, what's the big deal? You go home to be with Jesus. Right? Again, none of us are afraid of death. We're afraid of dying. That's the problem. Take that up with the Lord, okay? But... Here is God's answer to Habakkuk's complaint of what's going on. He said, don't worry about what's going on. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. What is Paul doing? He is taking each of the arguments from the Judaizers and deconstructing them. He's just cutting them off at the root. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Ooh. Well, I thought I was supposed to keep the law in order to be in right standing with God. Well, if the law is not based on faith, then that means I can't ever be in a right standing with God by keeping the law. Seriously, amen. Amen. But most of us don't think of it in these terms. Most of us see the law, or somebody suggests it to us. Uh, let's be honest. I would never think of the law if somebody didn't come up to me and say, well, Richard, you know, you should be. Oh, I should? Why, why do we always respond that way instead of, what? You know, go pick on somebody else. Or my big brother is coming after you. Right. So, where did this quote come from? Again, Leviticus, one of the great hope books of the Bible, Leviticus. <laughs> Prior to this verse is a whole list of warnings about various sexual sin. When Jesus said, you know, if you've even looked at a woman with lust in your heart, he was summarizing this chapter. 
So after God lays all this stuff out for Israel, saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't, don't even think about doing this. No, 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 not this. Then he says, keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. The person who obeys them will live by them. Okay, I'll try that. And then he adds, at the end of the chapter, verse 29, everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. That's God speak for you are dead. And if, if, the, if the, the local government does what it's supposed to, you will be physically dead. They will kill you. So, the law is not based on faith. The law is based on doing what God tells you to do. What part of the law was by faith? The sacrificial system. What, what was it about a lamb that, that provided forgiveness to me? Nothing. But I believed in the God who told me that that lamb represented something. And therefore, based on my faith, God forgave me. Now, it couldn't be permanent because the blood of bulls and goats doesn't take away sin. But at that moment, I could walk by faith and God said, you are mine, you are my child. So now when people say, well, it's only the ceremonial part of the law that's been done away with, and then they take you back to the 10 and all the things that go along with the 10, all you've got is obey and live, disobey and die, and you have no means of getting forgiveness. None. Don't go to a partial law. It's the worst of all. Okay? I've got to hustle. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What was the curse? Death. The law of sin and death supersedes everything. It even superseded the Ten Commandments because we were under the sentence of death from Adam. Death reigned until Moses, okay? even without a law. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. If someone is guilty of a capital offense, is put to death, and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day, because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land of the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. God took this seriously. There were reasons for being killed. But once you were killed, it was done. And you were to be buried that same day. That's why it was such a big deal for them to get Jesus off the cross and bury him. This was such a big deal that there were men of David who went into the town where Paul was being, or Saul the king, the former king, was being held on display, hanging from the wall. They went that day and got his body and brought it home and buried it because this was that important. As bad as Saul was, he didn't deserve this kind of curse. And so they went and fought their way through, got the body, brought it home, and buried him. Jesus hung on that tree. He redeemed us. He took the curse for us. Why? In order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, ethnos, all peoples, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. The Judaizers had come in and said, no, 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 no. You've got to be circumcised and you've got to keep the law. And Paul took every one of their arguments, and this continues, we'll see more of this next week, every one of their arguments and cuts it to pieces and lays it out before them and says, and why do you want to take over the role of the Holy Spirit in the lives of these people? And people, why would you let them wrap you up in this goo? Don't do it. Jesus is sufficient or nothing is. Jesus took away all sin or no sin. Jesus provides eternal life or there is no such thing as life. 
It's all Jesus. Do not get yourself tied up in the law. Okay, so talked about a lot of things. I could talk about a lot more. Let me give you a few points to write down so you see what it was we were talking about today. The only way to, bring, to begin salvation is in the Spirit, by grace through faith. It's the only way to begin. The only way to end salvation is in the Spirit, by grace through faith. Okay? It's by grace, through faith, from first to last. Has everybody written that down who wants to? The Abrahamic, not the Mosaic covenant, is our touchstone. Did you notice that? Paul uses the law to destroy the arguments of the, the legalists, but his strongest argument is to keep pointing people back to Abraham. All peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. It has nothing to do with law. It has everything to do with faith. All who respond by faith are children of Abraham and children of God. You cannot be a proper child of Abraham or a child of God by law. You cannot. Don't even try. And I know that's hard for some of you. It's hard for me still. I've been out of that for 20-some years now. And I still catch myself. Remember I told you last time? There are days I get up a legalist. In fact, every day would, would be that if I didn't stop and say, it's your day, Lord. It's your power. It's your spirit. Even in the most mundane stuff, it's all of Jesus and none of me. That's how you become a child of Abraham, a true Jew, if you will. You don't do it by law. There is law, and that law has a curse. Jesus redeemed us from that curse. How did he do that? By becoming the curse. He died so that I didn't have to. And more than that, he died so that I could live because he was raised from the dead. That's why this is about gospel and not gospel. Abraham's blessing is for Gentiles. Gentiles being all people other than Jews. And surprise, surprise, it's for the Jews too. Because Abraham is the father of the Jews. So ethnically, the Jews had a, a big advantage, right? You read Romans 9 and 10, you find out all this cool stuff that the Jews got to do and, and to accomplish for God. Actually, that God accomplished through them for the rest of us. And what they were supposed to do was say, thank you, Lord. Hey, Gentiles, do you realize there's this Messiah coming? And when Jesus got here, they could have said, Jesus is the Messiah. But instead, they wanted to close it up and hold it and be, be racist. Everything for the Jews and nothing for the Gentiles. But Abraham's blessing is for all peoples. Why? So that all can receive the Spirit. So that all can receive the Spirit. You see why it is so serious to answer the question, how shall we live? How are we blessed? From where did the blessing come? From whom did that blessing come? How do I hold on to that blessing? How does that blessing hold on to me? Whenever you find yourself walking toward the flypaper of the law, of the flesh, of the works of your hands, listen to the Spirit screaming in your head, don't go there. You will be sorry. I'll go right there with you, and I can free you from that if you'll let me. But let's not go over there anymore. Let's walk by faith. The hearing of faith versus the works of law. Faith wins every time. Let's pray. Lord God, this, this short passage is just so rich. We can't even scratch the surface of it, and yet just reading it 
just pondering it a little bit is enough to change our lives. Only your word can do that. Only your spirit can make that real in us. And we thank you for it. And we thank you that you scream at us and try to turn us in, in all of the things that, that you do to prevent us from walking over to the flypaper of the law. And then you're gracious enough to clean off the muck and bring us back anyway. We don't deserve that. But you do it. And you do it every time. And you'll do it forever. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name.